Hey, everybody. Joshua, good to see you as always. Hey, Paul. We won't have uh, Tara to help moderate this time, so hopefully I'll notice whenever y'all chat at me if something's going wrong. How's everybody's weekend going? Oh, that's exciting. You um, got a place lined up for uh, for Berlin? Berlin's a great place to be right now. I feel like it's one of the highest, by far the highest concentrations of, of people who are really into like uh, the distributed web and and peer-to-peer um, -peer technology right now. So I think you'll be in good company there. Hey, Moritz, good to see you. Ooh, company flat, that's exciting. One second, I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, well, it's 2 o'clock, so um, Tara thinks it's pretty important we get started straight away, and so let's get started. Hey, Wes Todd, good to see you. Uh, Cedric, I will let y'all know what WebTerm is, uh, I guess right now. So WebTerm is a project that I've been working on personally off and on every once in a while. It's a uh, command line client that um, it's not... Uh, terminal emulator. It doesn't have anything to do with Bash or um, anything that really has existed before. The idea is we have a lot of stuff in the um, Beaker universe um, that starts to get much more system-like where you have uh, this file system, this distributed file system in the form of that. And so, you know, we're kind of every once in a while I think to myself it would be nice to have a command line environment that was native to the browser uh, to the Beaker browser even, um, so that I could run one-off commands, file operations, things like that. So like moving around files or um, jump into an editor quickly, things like that. And the reality is I just haven't had a whole lot of time to, to execute on it. So a while back I wrote a post about this where I was talking about how we're starting to look at the browser as more like a network operating system as opposed to something that browses and consumes the web. And so as we get deeper into that, we have to ask, what kind of tools do you need? And we've gone back and forth. Um, if we start to get really deep into a file system, do we run the risk of creating um, configuration management complexity for people, much in the same way that Unix already has? 
um, it's possible. Um, so we're sort of incrementing our way forward on that and making sure we're making the best choice possible. But every once in a while, I still think it would be really nice to have this terminal that I could work with that's inside the browser. And I'm not the first person to think about something like this. Um, Steve Wittens did this term kit project and had a lot of the same ideas that uh, web term is all about. Um, saying, first of all, this was, a, by the way, a project that he didn't end up finishing. But his first thought was, look, we have GUIs. Why doesn't the command line interface start to get a richer display? Why don't we start integrating some um, graphical user interface elements into the, into the terminal? And frankly, there's a pretty straightforward way to do that. You just get some HTML in there. That seems like a pretty good idea. He also talks about how uh, Unix pipes or a little bit too dumb and suggests that instead we could use um, JSON objects to pipe between um, different applications and get perhaps a better um, experience overall. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. This is definitely not something, again, that I've had the time to really come up with a big idea. And so after spending a little time and thinking, okay, HTML in the command line would be nice using being able to pass around objects between commands would be nice having gotten that far i kind of stopped and said okay i don't really have a whole lot of time to develop this except to just kind of play with it incrementally as i go so this is web term now and it has all the basic tools that a terminal needs to get started in terms of you know the ui is there um, and it also uses html rendering um, I wrote up a kind of a spec a long time ago, actually. It's now inside this repo. So if you go to github.com slash pphrasy slash webterm, you can find the repo for this. And some of these ideas I think are still good. Some of them I may end up giving up on just because um, uh, my ambition is scaled back a little bit. Yeah, I'll put that link in there. So there's a link to the repo. And then web term itself is right here. So let me talk a little bit about the design that I've been going with here. Um, it's all JavaScript. That's going to be our scripting language, so to speak. Um, every command takes in an options object as the first parameter, and then any number of arguments. And um, the syntax for the command line is this right here, where any attributes which are have a dash in front of them get um, a single dash get parsed as a flag, a binary flag. Double dash become a key value, where the value ends up being whatever string follows the uh, key name. And then everything else becomes an argument, an unstructured argument that follows in. I'm actually using Minimist, which is an existing node module, to do that parsing. Why not? Um, and then there are a couple of uh, globals that are accessible. I think actually right now they're under the E and V object, um, so that you can find out where you are. And the globals object will probably grow over time. Every one of these functions, in, a in addition to returning an object, can return a two HTML function. Um, and that's possible at the moment because all of the commands invoked are actually invoked inside of the same JavaScript context as the um, environment. It's all just a bunch of JavaScript functions that I'm importing into the app. Um, and I have an idea for sub invocations that aren't in there yet. Commands can be asynchronous and eventually commands will be able to have interactive UIs. Okay, well, let's step back a little bit and look at what the environment file looks like. Whenever the thing starts up, it loads up this environment file. And it's basically a, a um, JavaScript that includes all of the functions that are going to be available inside of the environment. So you'll notice right here, we've got a help function, which is under the wrong heading, so let's move that up. And if I uh, jump over to um, web term and type in help, okay, so there's the output of that command, right? Now notice, not only does it have um, 
a text output, but there's colors involved here, and that's because we're using HTML. So this is the help command. It just iterates these this array of uh, method information, and then um, spits out a div for each one with the method name and then a description. Uses some uh, a padding um, mechanism, which is this right here, to get that aligned column view. And then I've got this function env.html, which is actually uh, nano HTML, um, which means that actually this template string gets parsed and then converted into a native DOM element, so that if I return this native DOM element, it gets rendered to the page. Um, so right, we just have all these different functions. This is so the env, env file, uh, environment file. This is all of my commands that are inside of my command line environment. And uh, so I've got to list the directory. I've got to change the current directory. Directory, what the current directory is. I've got an echo function and then some internal methods. Now again, this is just a side project that I've been working on, a way to kind of explore what it would be like to have a nice um, user land command line which may end up being helpful maybe not that's one of the reasons again that I'm taking it slowly because I'm not really sure this is going to have a lot of long-term utility but it could but for that reason I don't have any sort of prog uh, program or application model to this it's just a collection of functions that are dumped in the environment file and I'll probably keep on doing it that way because it's just so convenient. Um, so what I'm going to be doing today is just building out my environment file even more, adding more commands to WebTerm um, so that I can kind of get further into getting a feel for how useful this tool is and decide whether or not it's worth putting more dev time into. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was play around a little bit with the um, HTML rendering because if you look we've got this ls function and we're using a little bit of HTML to bold the directories which is pretty cool uh, but I think it'd be really nice if these were just links right so let's start with that let's see what that would be like you know we've got this list command and the basic function of every one of these commands is to return an object or an array of some kind right and that's going to be helpful for composition at some point so the basic thing that needs to happen is we get the current working directory out of the environment. Um, and uh, let's see, location. Okay, so we can pass in a ls dev and we can see what's inside of the dev folder, right? So that's that parameter there. So um, we take that, get a final location um, on the current working directory's archive, and then we read that directory and get the information to. Um, the stat, so we run stat on every one of the files that gets listed. And then we have this listing array. Now we could just return that, and that would be um, probably, let's see how I wrote this thing, it probably will end up rendering JSON. Yeah, just the object. And it probably needs to do some kind of wrapping. But uh, by defining to HTML, we give the web term a function to, to invoke whenever it's given an object and it goes, okay, well, I need to put this object on the screen. It runs the two HTML function. And as a result, well, I'm going to turn on live reloading to make this easier. As a result, you get this nice output. So the two HTML function, um, first of all, it does a filter to get rid of um, uh, dot directories to hide the, you know, the using the old Unix convention where a dot directory is hidden. So unless you have the dash a or dash dash all, then it's going to hide the hidden. Let's see if there are any hidden. I don't think there are any hidden in here. Oh, yeah, there is, right, because I'm on the preview branch. So there you go, right? Um, runs a sorting function, which puts the directories up at the top and then does a name comparison, colors things based on whether or not they're hidden, and then renders based on whether or not they're a directory. Okay, well, let's make them links, see what that's like. And um, just a little bit of a you know, heads up, I'm kind of um, finding out what this is like as I go. So um, this may end up being awesome and working great, um, or it may not. This is an exploration for me. Um, so I'm going to say, first of all, we ought to unify these renderings. So we'll do um, 
weight equals. I suppose the easiest way to do this would be to say if it's a directory, we'll use strong, and if it's not, we'll use a span. So that's one way to do that and see how it reacts. Yeah, okay, that worked. So now that's unified, that's good. Always good to deduplicate the amount of logic involved. So now let's get an array, or a, excuse me, an anchor tag in here. And let's see, we have an entry that's stat. Let's find out what that entry has on it. I think probably what it's going to have is uh, every entry is probably an object, and uh, and they have a yeah they have a name which is their local name. So I need to get the full path of the um, entry from the name which means I need to use location and I need to use cwd.archive. Um, Mike's pointing out that I'm wearing the same hat as last time. Yeah, it's because I um, need a shower. That's what that's about. Okay, so let's see. I should be able to do cwd.archive.url. Uh, plus uh, and then I need to uh, join path of the location and the entry dot name, and that should get us the correct URL. We will find out momentarily. By the way, if anybody here has not played with Nano HTML and Nano Morph, you are missing out. Let me get that in here. Nano HTML and Nano Morph are the tools that are being used here. This is actually Nano HTML. Um, and let me get that link into the chat. So that's nano HTML and then nano morph. These tools together really sort of replicate the functionality of React, um, but they're designed to do everything that React does in a really sort of um, more minimal fashion. Um, nano HTML is just this template string tool which you can use to pass in HTML as a template string, and it will emit um, a native DOM element. Super handy. It's similar to what JS, JSX accomplishes. Um, then uh, nanomorph is a single function which takes in a target DOM element and takes in any DOM node, diffs the two of them, and then gives you the expected result based on which um, target you passed in, um, effectively doing what React does. Um, now, Nanomorph and Nano HTML, they're not going to be as efficient as React uh, for a couple of reasons. Nano HTML does its parsing of this HTML at runtime. And there are plugins you can use to do pre parsing, but I never use them. Um, and then I suspect that because Nanomorph is diffing directly off of the DOM, it's probably slower by some amount. But it's fast enough for me. In fact, this is basically the tool set we use to create the UI for Beaker. Um, so uh, if you're looking for something that's a little more lightweight than React, uh, doesn't require a compile step, uh, Nano HTML and uh, Nanomorph are great. They're both part of the Chu project. Okay, so let's find out. I don't know why I decided to go into a little pitch for Nano HTML right before we try out the results of this update. So let's let's get back to it here. All right, we got links. Now are they the right links? We got yes, 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 yes. All right, so the links seem to work. Why don't I CD into dev real quick and see if things worked right? All right, I have, yeah. Yeah, I think our links are all correct, so that's pretty sweet. Now, I don't know how I feel about having them all styled as links, but, uh, I mean, maybe, though. That sort of makes sense. Maybe like that. I've got this, you may have noticed whenever I did a CD, I got an LS automatically. It's because I something I threw in the other day. Little configuration making it do an LS automatically after running a CD, but let's get rid of that for a second. Okay, now having these links go to the actual things makes a lot of sense um, if I wanted to like middle click on them, but 
I actually want to be able to click on them and have it be the equivalent of a CD operation. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to make it so that um, the href will be there. If you middle click on it, it'll open up in the new tab. But I'm going to have an on click handler on this thing for a left click. I'm going to attach an event handler and make it so that it does a CD operation. And now we're getting really into GUI interactivity on the command line. Again, I don't know if this is a great idea, but uh, let's find out what happens. Do it like this. I'm going to define the onClick function inside of this map, which means I'm going to be defining a function object for every one of these things, which is not the most efficient, but also not something that we need to. Okay. Well. All right. Let's be a little bit. No, I'm not going to worry about it. It's not the most efficient to be defining a function for every one of the entries, especially because every time we do an ls command, we're going to be generating another set of these things. So. It would be probably smart to create some kind of on-click handler, which is reused every time. Um, but I'm not going to do that because I actually don't think I can avoid that. I'm going to have to use a closure no matter what. Um, so here we are. Let's just live with it. Uh, now I'm going to need some kind of way to run a terminal command. Let's see what my environment gives us right now. Okay, so here is the web terminal kind of master code, so to speak, the one, the thing that imports the, the environment and then runs it. Um, I've got some imports, which are obviously doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but the good news is that right now the web term execution code is only 200 lines of code. That's pretty light. Um, so we got, let's see, we, we pass in this terminal object, we pass in the HTML object, and we pass in morph. Right, that's nanomorph. Uh, interesting, a lot to think about that. But so, like these built-ins end up getting mixed into the env object, and the env object is actually it should be accessible. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's not a command, I guess. So let's see. Let's look at the command execution function. Eval prompt, I'm guessing. So. I have this funky little bit right here. Um, yeah, so here's the code that actually runs um, the command whenever I press the enter key. And um, you'll notice it's in this weird async function wrapper. Uh, what we're looking at here is we're doing a new async function, and then each of these is actually the parameters to the function. And then the function body is passed in as a template string. And this generates this eval prompt function that we can actually call. The reason I do that is that um, we're, uh, I believe, because we're using ES modules, we're in strict mode. I, might have, I think that's what the situation still is. That was how it was whenever I first wrote web term because it was a, you know. So I'm pretty sure we're still in, in use strict, which means we can't actually use the with command. But I want to use the with command because I want to take the env object and set it at the top level. Uh, and that's why all the commands can be, um, like, so what I do is I set that at the top level and then I just eval um, the uh, command. Um, and parse command basically takes this command and converts it into JavaScript and then just runs the JavaScript. So it's just an eval call, which I guess technically means that we should be able to Run JavaScript, is that possible? Let's see, command gets split off. The rest of it gets passed through Minimist. Minimist would probably mangle any of the JavaScript, so probably not. But I haven't actually looked into it. That'd be interesting to check into. Um, we could, of course, just get rid of the Minimist and uh, just eval JavaScript. But JavaScript isn't a really great command line language, so I'm not really inclined to do that. Uh, all right, so parse command uh, is part of eval prompt internal, which is part of eval prompt. All right. What we really need is a way to um, basically run a command. 
that's being given to you by another program. Which means I need to take some aspect of eval prompt and make it so that I can override what goes in. This right here. This needs to become a parameter. Actually, it should be easy. What we'll do is turn this into just eval command. And we will make the command one of the. Hmm. Why do I have to pass in all those functions? I'm sure I had a reason for writing this when I did it. But I'll tell you what, can't tell you off the top of my head. These are all objects that are in the functions and objects that are in the global scope. For some reason, I felt it necessary to pass them in explicitly. Uh, okay, then. Um, why don't we put command up at the front? And we'll maintain this eval command internal thing. And we'll turn this eval prompt into function eval command, and we'll pass in the command. And then eval prompt will read the command from the prompt. Okay. All right, let's see if that worked. Okay, didn't break anything, that's good. So let's then, um, let's expose the eval command as a uh, part of the environment, one of the built-ins. What should we call it? I feel like it should be on the term object, probably. And, except that, why do I even have the term object? Do we really need that sub, sub object? Let's get rid of it. Let's just do like this, and then we're just going to add eval command to the list of built ins. And now I just got to go through and find any env.tr and ep. Env.tr value. Just replace all these with env. And now, on click, let's just do a env.eval command echo test, test, test. And let's see what we get. Can't get it. That's interesting. Why did I just screw that up? Hmm. So for some reason, um, my ENV reference got screwed up. I don't know exactly why. Let's see. Oh, I have env.term being used elsewhere. Let me finish fixing that up. OK. Huh. OK. The, oh, I need to prevent default. Okay, so on my on click function, we have prevent default e dot stop propagation just to be safe. And then we're going to do env dot eval command echo testing test test. Most of the work that I do tends to be with some kind of build step live reloading. It's so nice to get to work on a project that doesn't have that. Okay, it works, sweet. So then let's uh, make this a CD and then um, I guess just to name, and that should do it. Uh, Entry.name. <laughs> I'm 
write you can't cd into files. Should have thought about that one. But hey, this seems to work. And then I can open up in a new tab with a middle click. That's pretty sweet. Um, as far as potential command line environments go, I think that's pretty awesome. Let's find out what this extra space is about. Ah, just an extra space. Let's fix that. Yeah, right. Okay. 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 Obviously, we don't want to CD into files. So, how? What should the click behavior be when you click on a file? I mean, it would make sense to open it in a new folder, I guess. So maybe I just. Hmm, yeah, I guess I could just have it open in a new tab. That's probably the best choice for now. It would also make sense to have it open in like an editor or something like that if I could choose a default editor. But I don't have any editors yet, so we'll do that. What we'll do is. Um, in fact, we'll just only set on click if it's a directory. Mm, yep. Yeah. And then we'll set target blank. And that should do it. That should do the trick. So now if I click on that.json, it opens up in a new tab. And then if I click on dev, it CDs into dev. Great. I feel like it should ls automatically if you click on it. But of course that's a config, so we'll just turn that config back on. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Now I noticed something kind of unusual earlier, a little bit of a bug. If I cd into dev and then cd down, this listing up here is incorrect. That's bug number one. Bug number two is that it lets you CD into a file. It doesn't take a look at what you're trying to go into and make sure it even exists. In fact, I probably could CD into a non-existent location. Yeah, and it knows that it's not found, but it didn't stop me. Let's start with that. Let's start by fixing that about my CD command. After that, I think I'll probably start adding some other commands, like um, some maybe some file manipulation commands could be good. Uh, so, let's see, here's the cd command, that's the location. What I probably need to do is I could have the set cwd function, which is part of the environment, do this check for us and fail. That might be a smart way to do this. But then I would need to await, which makes CD async. But that's probably okay. So I'm gonna do that. Make a uh, CD asynchronous, and then we're gonna make it so you have to. Uh, you're gonna have to await this function. We'll just let whatever error happens go all the way up, bubble all the way up, and um, the error will get dumped, and that'll be that. All right, so then set CWD is now ace, going to have to be asynchronous, which should be fine. So we parse the location. If that's successful, then we push the state and then we read CWD. Of course, that's what we do. Parse URL is called there. Okay. So we're going to first uh, create the archive for the location. Location.host, and then we are going to try a stat. Um,
actually, we don't even need to wrap that in a try catch because what we want to do is just let the whole thing throw if it fails. And what else we want to do is make sure it's actually a folder. CD command now checks out what you're trying to go to, make sure it exists, make sure it's a directory. If any of those things fail, bombs out. Pretty straightforward. We gotta get some styles on these errors. It'd be cool to have like some, you know, some icons in there too, but for now. Some pretty obvious stuff that needs to happen here. Obviously, it needs to be a horrible bright red to make you feel really bad about the mistake you just made. Yeah, that seems about right. Maybe a light red background. To, I suppose that's called pink. That's what you call that. Yeah, now you feel really bad. I think that the error stack is where that light red needs to be. Yeah, I mean, you can't miss that. Okay, so that's in our web term CSS error. Uh, we'll say the, that's pink, and this is red. Yeah, that is the appropriate level of UI um, shame that you should feel, you know. Mm, get that right out there. You made a mistake. All right. So um, now I think maybe I'm just going to make a couple of commands like, um, I don't know, make like a rename command and a delete file command. I could try to make a, a make. Uh, yeah, why don't I make make directory and delete directory? Those seem like good commands to have. So let's start with that. I'm gonna jump into my environment file where all my commands are defined. I'm gonna start by getting the interactive help. And I'm gonna steal the function names from existing command lines because that's what I'm familiar with. So why not? And both of these functions are really just going to be aliases for um, data archive functions. So we'll do export function mkdir. Probably uh, And then remove directory. So if anybody has any questions, by the way, while we're hanging out here, feel free to ask in the chat. Part of uh, these live streams is to give everybody an option to um, ask me about something if they have any questions or bug me about something going wrong in the software. Feel free, now is your chance. Okay. If no target name, then we gotta throw. Uh, I guess I need like a usage.
And so this would be like um, I suppose that's that. New lines are not getting respected here. Hmm. Here, yeah. definitely not there. I'll have to figure that out later. Then uh, we have an, a CWD that we get, and there's got an archive on that. And we need to figure out how to get this logic standardized. So let's do that real fast. I would bet that this is used uh, a couple of places. Let's see, there's LS. CD has its own thing. Okay, just here. So then, uh, target name equals to CWD location, target name. That keeps it, makes it a relative path to the current location, makes it so that if they just use a starting slash, we'll treat it as an absolute path. If not, we'll make it a relative path to the current location. And then we will just run await CWD dot mk here target name pretty straightforward. Same logic should apply over here, except not only do we change the function obviously, but we have a recursive option. Okay. Got to call that function off of the archive, not CWD. There it is. <laughs> All right, RMD or test. Of course, it's going to live reload because I'm self modifying. All right. There we go. MK deer and RM deer now exist. That's pretty cool. Uh, let's make sure the absolute paths work. Let's turn off that live reloading for a second. Yeah, RM deer test. That worked. Now let's check and see if. The recursive stuff works. So by default, a directory has to be uh, empty for RMD to work. There we go. So I should be able to now do RMD test dash R. Now it's gone. Sweet. This thing is starting to look actually kind of familiar, kind of like a terminal. 
Well, that's an RM deer and MK deer. Uh, maybe a move command. That would be pretty reasonable to work on. Let's do it. Start by writing the live help. Let's get the copy in there too. Really ought to have a similar definition overall to make deer and RM deer. Um, you know, I mean, first of all, let's um, rename these to BST. A little, uh, little consistency. And then we just need to have the same sorts of logic called on both source and destination. And then I believe, if I remember correctly, it's just a rename method, SRC and DST. Basically the exact same logic in CP, except that we renamed that to copy. Now let me check my documentation real quick, make sure I got those function names right. So Joshua says, when I first opened up WebTerm, my instinct was to CD to your footer profile URL, but the, clearly the URL is relative to the website you're browsing. Does the reflex make sense to me? It does make sense to me. Um, and I'll hit that in half a second. You also asked what happens if you RM to your part of WebTerm while you're in it. Probably that breaks the WebTerm, if I had to guess. That probably wouldn't go great. But you can actually CD to other um, uh, domains. You just have to give it either a double slash at the beginning or a full URL, so cd.beakerbrowser.com. And I suppose that's a pretty... Oh. How did that happen? Whoa, what is going on? Get out of here. Huh. What just happened? Okay. Anyway, I suppose that was a pretty important thing to mention early on because it's one of the cooler things about this thing is that you can browse around the entire dat web using the web term. Um, and uh, I just happen to be in the deep, you know, by default at the current directory, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that kills the, uh, there's a tilde to go back to the home. But yeah, that, this kills the, the web term if you delete the web term. Okay, let's see. Let's check our docs, check our docs, check our docs. And of course, we should check the peer to peer versions of the docs because why else? Do we have a peer to peer web? We're not going to use it. Okay. And let's head over to the reference. And methods. Oh, I do not have enough screen real estate. Copy and rename. Okay, let's either of them, nope, none of them need recursive parameters. You'd think I'd remember these things, but I don't. All right, moment of truth, let's see what we got. Copy index.html to foo.html. And if I give it a click, there we go. And let's move index, no tab completion yet. We're gonna need that someday. Move index, no, move foo.html to bar.html. Seems to have worked, all right. Let's move bar.html to dev bar.html. There it is. All right, that's working too. But now I've got that and my whole 
um, that bar file I need to get rid of, which means I need an RM function. Pretty easy stuff. And let's get rid of that. Okay. Well, look at that. We got, what is that, five more commands? Plus ls now has links inside of it. So these are all handy things to have. Let's see, um, obviously a create archive or a fork archive command would make a lot of sense. Maybe, um, what else is the file? Well, let's, you know, here's a simple way to figure out what to do next. Just consult the uh, docs here. Could do um, read file, like a cat function. Um, we could do, um, let's see, we could do also a stat, just dump out the um, results of a stat call. Uh, let's see, I guess we could come up with something similar to echo, but it's designed to write to a file, because we don't have piping, right? Now eventually what we'll have is um, a form of composition through what I'm going to, what I call a sub-invocation, but that's not implemented yet, so... I would need some kind of something like echo where you specify a path to be your target. Could even just make that a parameter of echo so that you could say write to a file as opposed to write to the output. Copy, rename, history might be good. Checkout might, mm, yeah, checkout could be good. Download, watch. Why don't I just get a why don't I just add a way to write the echo to a file? It seems like a really handy thing to have. So I'll do it like this. And then we'll say uh, if ops dot destination, then Now we'll make it two. Let's not get fancy with it. Um, and then we'll do to see location step two, and then we'll do cd archive. We should also get an append flag in here. If append flag, then we will do This turned out. So let's do echo to root.txt. CID not defined. I need to grab that. Sweet. That seems pretty handy. Little echo function. Turn on live reloading and try the append flag. There we go. All right, now I can echo to a file. Not as elegant as what Unix has, but I uh, was able to write it real quick. So that's cool. 
And uh, I think I'm going to call it a day on working on WebTerm. But hopefully you can kind of see why this is um, could be useful someday. I would like to have it be just this easy to continue to write more commands. And the way that I'm kind of thinking that I'll keep building this thing out is that you'll be able to um, publish environment files and then like import from each other's environment files and just basically build up your own set of commands that you might want to have available to you whenever you're doing some kind of work in the, the DAT ecosystem. This is definitely a tool that I think could be helpful for some uh, stuff like um, maybe build processes. Um, and I also think we could get even deeper into interactivity in the responses of these things so that you know you can register click handlers on these um, on these uh, responses here so you can put in a fully fledged UI put in a whole form you could have basically a little miniature app show up as a result of a command click around inside of it um, so like a lot of possibility there and I feel like having it be just an open simple tool um, means that this will end up being not a huge ordeal to um, make work the way that we want it to make. The question kind of ends up being um, a little bit about security model. If you're just inlining all these functions, then those functions inherit the permissions of the WebTerm app. It might be a little bit of a problem. Like you could definitely nuke WebTerm with the command, as you were talking about earlier. Um, of course, if WebTerm is read only, as it will be for everybody except me, that may not be a problem. Um, so yeah, cool. Uh, got about five more minutes before the end of the live stream. We like to keep it at an hour. So um, if anybody has any questions or anything they want to share, uh, now's your chance. Uh, I hope this was uh, fun and interesting. Um, I was at a, I was traveling this weekend, so I didn't really have time to put anything else together. So I thought, all right, I'll just show a web term see. See what people think of that. I uh, also would be interested to hear if y'all think that this is something that's worth um, continuing to pursue. Because um, if not, you know, I could definitely, I have a lot of places I can spend my time. So like having this be, um, uh, right now it's just kind of a off time project, a toy project that, uh, that I work on every once in a while. But um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe also if somebody in the community feels like it's worth it. I would be more than happy for people to fork it and take it their own direction or, or even try to work with me and kind of develop it out further. Um, but it's all really straightforward, kind of simple code. So like I, you know, it's not like a, it should require a lot of coordination to build off of what I've already got going. Uh, Josh was saying this looks like something that could be a part of Beaker. Then a guy thinking, why are things that are parts of Beaker hard coded? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Originally, this was hard coded. That was the idea. It maybe started as a potential feature for Beaker, and um, what I really wanted to do is have be able to press Command tilde and have this open up based on whatever location I'm currently at. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but you know, uh, seeing as I wasn't really sure if the value prop of this is that great, I started to say, you know, maybe instead we can just move this to user land and experiment there, and that's where it's at right now. Um, as for why the other things are built in, that has more to do with just um, those, those things we know are going to be a core part of the experience and we know we need to get right and we know they need to be built in. If we move them into user land, they, you open up some possibilities of complexity like um, what if the DAT is uh, uh, not reachable whenever they first load Beaker and we don't yet have a good way to package a DAT um, with the install. There's also permission questions you have to answer. Um, if we were to move, for instance, the library into user land, we also have to give the library permissions to access all those things. And we've made a little bit of progress in terms of opening up some experimental APIs that allow that, but um, we're just not ready to say like, yes, the all of the built-in pages of Beaker should be some kind of special user land applications. We're just building them in for now. It's entirely possible that'll change. It's just we don't yet have a, our heads wrapped around the full um, ecosystem of, of user land yet, so it feels premature to start trying to move built-in pages out of being built in. Um, that said, we do have some experimental APIs for manipulating the library, which um, I can show real quick. 
and uh, you know created this specifically so that people have an opportunity to play around a little bit more and try things that we aren't thinking about. Uh, so it's a lab API, uh, which means it could be taken away at any moment. Um, so caveat emptor, and um, it has some methods for adding and removing dats in the library. Also, you could use this one, which requires less permissions you know, per item request, uh, as well as listing what's in the at the library. Um, so, you know, give that a shot if you're interested in playing around with uh, something that replaces the library, um, and let us know what else you need and, and how it's going for you. But it makes us a little nervous because we're still getting our head around um, permissions and people's um, the safety of their data. And so, you know, pros and cons. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and publish all the changes I made to uh, WebTerm. Uh, this interface right here is what I have been working on for the past you know, couple weeks. It's not ready yet. It's not done yet. Um, but um, we have been working for forever on trying to get the authoring tool set right for Beaker. Um, and I think we're actually finally making some progress. I'm going to be doing a lot of user interviews on this, um, get people to record their screens and, and make sure it's all kind of intuitive. But we now have the ability to set a local folder if you want or not, and um, also the ability to set a preview mode where you can preview changes to pu before publishing or not. Uh, they're completely detached from each other, which was hard to get going, but now it's there. Um, and uh, it's really handy for something like WebTerm because um, you know I want to be able to see what I'm doing because maybe other people are using WebTerm and I don't want every little edit I make to get published out. I may be publishing bugs or half-finished features. Um, so to deal with that, we turn on preview mode and you get this interface and then um, you can open up at the special checkout, the, dot, the plus preview checkout. This is kind of similar to what used to exist with the staging area, but now we have this special checkout to indicate you're looking at the local preview as opposed to what's been published. If I go to what's been published, you'll see the uh, older version of Hashbase, the one that's actually on the network, right? So this is what was there when we started. Uh, yeah, Joshua, I thought you might, I thought a few people might notice that. So, right, the preview is showing what's sort of locally being worked on, and as you can see, that's got the changes I've made. And so now I can go over to this interface and review all the changes that are made. And uh, it's got a little a few bugs still, stuff like that. The padding has got all thrown off there. But um, I'm pretty sure this is all stuff that's what I want. So I'm going to publish all these changes. OK. Um, so I've still got a little bit of work to do on those interfaces, um, but you know, I think maybe uh, in the next couple of weeks we'll put out another one, hopefully last uh, pre-build of 08 with some of the stuff in there so that we can start to get feedback from y'all, find out if we are finally coming close to getting these tools right. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but it's now 3 o'clock, so that's the hour mark. So I think I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, but thank you all for coming. I hope this was um, interesting to see. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little more structured um, uh, educational live stream next week, but it was a travel weekend, so just a little casual hacking today. Uh, if you're looking for me online, you can find me on Twitter, find me on IRC, uh, and GitHub, uh, and email too. So uh, feel free to reach out with any questions you got. And I'll see you all online. So everybody, catch you all later. Have a good weekend.